Okay, what is going on everyone? Um, so what follows in this video is a conversation that I had with Jorn Trommelin, uh, who's currently pursuing his PhD. Uh, his area of research focuses on muscle protein synthesis, uh, and he's pursuing that over in the Netherlands, at one of the leading labs in this field. Um, Jorn is a, a really smart and well-read guy, uh, as you'll see, very acquainted with all of the scientific literature on this topic. So this is actually just going to be part one of our conversation, uh, and in this part, we focus mostly on training, uh, so as to max out the muscle protein synthetic response. And then in part two, uh, which was actually supposed to be uh, the main focus of the interview, uh, we focus on diet, um, so how to eat so as to max out muscle protein synthesis. Um, we ended up getting a little bit carried away and going down the rabbit hole with training, uh, but it turned out to be, I think, very informative, um, so I hope that you guys like it. Um, if you would like to hop around, I'm going to have timestamps down there in the description as usual, um, so you can skip according to topic that you're interested in. And also make sure you go over and check out uh, your Warren's website. I'll have that linked in the description. Uh, it's very helpful. And if you'd rather listen on another platform, I am going to upload this on my podcast. Um, I'm still in the process of rebranding that right now. Uh, but I think if you just search Jeff Nippard, you should be able to, to find it um, in iTunes. And I'll put it up on Stitcher as well. Um, so you can listen on the go. Um, but for the rest of you, uh, feel free to comment down below. Uh, Jorn said he was going to pay attention to the comments and answer any serious questions that you might have down there. Um, so if there's something you're curious about, um, just drop us a comment and we'll do our best to get back to you. So uh, without further ado, uh, here is my conversation with Jorn Trommelin. All right, so everyone, I'm here with Jorn Trommelin, and we're going to have a discussion today about uh, protein intake and in particular some of the work that he's been doing on muscle protein synthesis. Um, so, Jorn, I just wanted to say thanks, man, for coming on and sharing all your knowledge with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. For sure. Um, so, before we dig in with all this, um, maybe you can give the listeners some idea of uh, what you've been up to, uh, what you're currently working on. Yeah, so I'm a, a researcher at Maastricht University in the Netherlands, um, and our research group focuses on muscle metabolism. So, we got a pretty big group, um, some different research interests, but it all centers around uh, muscle metabolism. So we have a few people who focus on sarcopenia, so uh, age-related muscle loss and how we can prevent that with uh, nutrition and exercise. And others are focused on muscle loss uh, in kidney patients, for example, or during uh, immobilization when you break a leg. And then me and a few others are mostly focused on, on athletes. Um, so either looking at ergogenic aids like uh, creatine or um, carbohydrate diets for endurance athletes or uh, protein supplementation um, for those who want to build um, strength and size. Um, and then our lab is probably best known uh, for the use of metabolic tracers. Um, so what you can do, for example, is simply do uh, a training study and see whether or not you become bigger or stronger from an intervention. But we really like to look uh, what's going on in the muscle. So uh, we often take muscle biopsies and then we can study uh, the underlying processes. And yeah, that often forms the, the basis of better understanding interventions and coming up with even smarter interventions rather than just concluding whether or not something works. Uh, of course, that's also very important, but we really like, uh, yeah, understanding the mechanisms uh, and uh, coming up with future hypotheses. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> I've noticed just like in the field, a lot of bodybuilders and strength athletes have taken a liking to your work because of the, I guess, crossover application there. Um, do you have an interest in bodybuilding or like what's your personal interest that kind of got you into working in this field? Um, well, I was pretty much the, the skinniest guy you've ever seen, uh, still far from a uh, physique athlete, but we're doing a little bit uh, better. I always joke that I no longer have to run to get wet in the shower. <laughs> um, but, um, um, yeah, so I just, yeah, started lifting. Um, I asked the biggest guy in the gym, like, how did you get so big? And he was like, yeah, you seem to work out, um, pretty hard and this was all when I was like a teenager but what about your nutrition and this was before YouTube was a thing before social media was a thing I was like nutrition what what does that have to do with anything and then I started to look uh, on internet there wasn't that much uh, at that time and then at some point I stumbled upon an abstract uh, and I was on like an internet forum uh, 
And I was like, what is this weirdly formatted piece of text? <laughs> Someone says, yeah, it's basically a, a summary of, uh, of a study. And then, yeah, I try to understand it. it was all confusing. And that's pretty much how I stumbled into research. And uh, luckily, I have, uh, I think, uh, more talent for research than, uh, than uh, fitness. So um, I've pretty much gone all in on that. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, we're so grateful for your work because it, it really does have quite a lot of application. Um, and it, for any of the listeners who aren't aware, like I've, I've drawn from uh, quite a bit of your work, uh, especially recently. And there's one piece that you have on the internet that's basically like a wiki of everything you could ever want to know about muscle protein synthesis. Um, and that was that was really fantastic um, and really, really helpful. So um, if you'd like maybe a, a more in-depth summary of maybe some of the stuff we talk about here, I'll, I'll link that down in the description or the show notes um, so you guys can go check it out. It, it's That was amazing. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so I guess what we'll, what we'll start with is uh, muscle protein synthesis. Um, so... That's a term you hear thrown around a lot. I feel like a lot of people might not know exactly what it is. Um, so maybe you can give us a quick primer on what that process involves. Yeah, so I like to say that uh, muscle protein synthesis, it isn't really rocket science. Uh, it's much more complicated than that. Um, but the simple <laughs> version is not that hard. Um, so the analogy I like to use is that your muscles uh, are like a wall um, in bodybuilding. You want to build that wall bigger and uh, the bricks of that wall uh, are amino acids. So uh, the building blocks of protein. So we eat protein and we want to add the, uh, those to our muscles. So the addition of amino acids to the wall is called muscle protein synthesis. Um, but at the same time, the wall is also being broken down. Uh, and that process is called muscle protein breakdown. And um, both processors are always running. Um, so it's not like, oh, I'm anabolic, so I'm uh, in a muscle protein synthetic state. No, they're both running. Um, it's just if one exceeds the other, you're in a positive balance, so you're growing. Or if breakdown exceeds synthesis, you're in a ne uh, net negative balance and uh, you're shrinking. Um, so it sounds like both are very important, but actually muscle protein synthesis is much more important than muscle protein breakdown for a variety of reasons. Um, the first one is that uh, muscle protein breakdown stays within a pretty narrow range. So it goes up a little bit um, with exercise and with nutrition, you can uh, reduce it a little bit. But in contrast, you can influence muscle protein synthesis a lot, like three to five fold increases. So whether or not you will be in a positive balance uh, or not, almost entirely depends on uh, your muscle protein synthesis. So yeah, and there's also like pretty much the only thing you can do to reduce breakdown uh, is to eat and you only need a minimal amount of insulin to uh, have the maximal uh, inhibit inhibitory effect on muscle protein breakdown. So anytime you're not fasted, essentially you've done what you could do. Uh, then the final issue is that uh, it sounds really bad, right? We want to make that wall bigger. So we want to prevent the breakdown of that wall. But so imagine you have uh, a house and you want to make that house bigger, uh, but there's some cracks in the walls. Do you really want to make that house bigger or is the whole thing going to collapse? So what you actually see is that muscle protein breakdown is useful. So you can genetically engineer rats, for example. You, for obvious reasons, you cannot do that in humans. Um, but if you genetically engineer uh, rats um, so that they cannot have muscle protein breakdown, these rats are actually smaller and weaker than rats that have normal functioning muscle protein breakdown. So yeah, muscle protein breakdown is a functional process, essentially. If you could theoretically totally prevent it, it's probably a bad thing. And it makes total sense. If you have cracks in your wall, you want to break down that small part of the wall, reuse those building blocks, and now you have a much stronger foundation to build on. So that's why in most studies, we only measure muscle protein synthesis. It almost entirely determines muscle protein uh, balance anyway. Uh, and at least in healthy uh, subjects uh, and in those who, yeah, athletes essentially, 
how high muscle protein breakdown rates are is very predictable. Mm-hmm. Might be a little bit different if you're talking about patient uh, populations, um, but yeah, for healthy people, muscle protein breakdown rates are not that interesting. Right. Um, I've kind of heard it like with resistance training, the goal is to kind of tear the muscle down a little bit. Um, so to kind of let that like muscle protein breakdown kind of sink in. And then with your nutrition after you kind of allow the, the, synth- the synthesis side of that equation to sort of exceed it so that the net balance is that you're kind of anabolic. Is that is that kind of true? Is that kind of part of the point of resistance training is, is to break the muscle down a little bit? Uh, not necessarily. So it's a little bit of a debated, uh, topic. So, uh, uh, Brad Schoenfeld has popularized uh, the theories of muscle hypertrophy, which are mechanical tension, metabolic stress, and muscle damage. And then uh, the latter two, so uh, muscle damage and metabolic stress, those are highly debated, um, with some people even saying uh, they have negative impact on muscle hypertrophy and should be avoided if possible. Um, so, yeah, you definitely don't need to induce muscle damage. Maybe a little bit is good. Maybe with a lot of these things, it's like uh, uh, a curve where a little bit is good and too much is bad, or it's uh, an inverted U curve where a little bit or a whole lot is bad, um, but in between is okay. Um, so it's not necessarily good or bad. It might depend on the amount, but um, no, the goal is definitely not induce as much damage as possible. If that was true, you would just go to uh, a boxing gym, get punched in the body all day, and you would be the most jacked guy ever. Yeah, exactly. So, so then, in what context is muscle protein breakdown good? So, when when you resistance train, is breakdown generally exceeding synthesis? Is that at least true, or no? Um, depends on your feeding state, right. uh, essentially. So, um. Pretty much any time you eat some protein, muscle protein synthesis rates will exceed muscle protein uh, breakdown rates. Oh, interesting. So yeah, if so, if you um, if you eat protein before a workout, and we've actually done uh, done those studies, then uh, even during training you can be anabolic, so in a positive uh, muscle protein balance. Right. So, it would would you say a goal? I guess would be to always have synthesis sort of exceed breakdown as much as you possibly can to be as anabolic as you possibly can? Uh, theoretically, yes. Now, in, I would say, the last five years, more research, and this has been inspired by the inter- intermittent fasting movement, uh, has looked at the role of autocaphy, which is essentially um, yeah, a form of muscle protein breakdown. And the idea is that if uh, during aging, for example, certain proteins get misfolded and they just accumulate in the body uh, and that's a bad thing essentially so if you fully prevent muscle protein breakdown bad things seem to happen but the ideal situation is uh, a pretty high turnover where there's a lot of protein breakdown so you never have old dysfunctional proteins but at the same time you are making more protein so you're gaining uh muscle mass, but at the same time, you make sure that you keep renewing uh, your old dysfunctional proteins. And that's a little bit similar what you see in the field of diabetes and exercise, um, where you see that endurance trained athletes, uh, they have a lot of uh, fat in their muscles, and that's a good thing, and they can use it as a fuel, where people with diabetes also have a lot of fat in their muscles, but it's a bad thing. It causes inflammation and insulin uh, resistance. And the idea there is the same, that if you have a high turnover of uh, the fats, so continuously uh, synthesis, but also breakdown of these fats, um, then it's healthy. So if I would summarize it, it is, uh, everything is just very dynamic. um, And people like to simplify it a little bit with if one is bigger than the other, it's good or not. But that's not really the case. Right, right. Um, so then if if the like sort of narrative that like you're, you're training to like tear the muscle down and then you eat the protein after and it builds it back up, that's kind of wishy-washy, sort of bro science, it, it seems, um, kind of. Um, so then what is the role of, of training then in, in this equation? Why, why does resistance training, why is that effective um, at building muscle, basically? Yeah, so... Um, well, it would be 
perfect if all we had to do uh, is eat protein. So we know protein stimulates muscle protein synthesis. And like I said, pretty much uh, anytime you eat protein, um, protein synthesis rates will exceed muscle protein breakdown rates. Um, however, we know you cannot just eat 500 grams of protein a day and become a bodybuilder. Would be, would be great, but doesn't work like that. So your body doesn't really seem to hold on to muscle protein if there's no need to. And um, that is more or less what exercise does. It tells your body like we can actually use all these proteins that we synthesize. So um, we know that there's synergy between the two that after exercise, you respond better to uh, protein. So one of the things you can do, um, so this comes back to those uh, tracers I mentioned earlier. Uh, you can build tracers in the protein um, that you feed to your subjects, for example. And then you can see how much of the amino acids um, from your nutrition uh, are being used for muscle growth. Um, and even if you don't train, some of the amino acids you eat uh, are being used to form new muscle tissue. But if you train, you simply utilize a lot more of those uh, amino acids in your nutrition. Um, very important to note is that effect is pretty long lasting. So. Uh, very common in the fitness industry is the so-called window of potential where you have to eat protein immediately after exercise. Um, that's not necessarily true. Um, depends a little bit on training status, most likely. Um, but for at least one to two days after exercise, if you eat protein, uh, you utilize it better if you've done some resistance exercise. So you really need the combination of both uh, if you want to grow. Mm -hmm. So you, you would say that resistance training basically makes the muscle sort of more sensitive to amino acid yes. uptake after training, and that effect lasts for 24, 48, or maybe even longer uh, after training. So that kind of, I guess, like devalues the necessity of, of getting those amino acids in right away after training. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so in regards to training, so I, I, I guess, as I see it, you have basically two factors that you can kind of manipulate you have training and diet so as to kind of max out muscle protein synthesis um so let's just quickly cover the training side of things first is there anything from your research you think you can pull from that you know can inform us on how to train so as to sort of maximize muscle protein synthesis yeah so i see training and programming as a combination of uh, science and an art um there's the, the science gives a few clear guidelines, basically the rules within you have uh, in which uh, you have to play. So there's clearly things that are just suboptimal, but then once you stay within those rules, you can essentially program to your desire. So um, yeah, basically there's been uh, research on all these variables. Um, for example, how many sets um, do you have to do? Now it's pretty clear um, that multiple sets, for example, are just better than one set. Um, when I grew up, um, high intensity training hit, so not the cardio variant, um, but just the, the strength training variant was pretty popular. And the idea was all you need is one balls to the walls set, uh, anything other than that is overtraining. Um, that's just completely wrong. Multiple sets are clearly superior for muscle protein synthesis and muscle growth um, than just one set. So how many sets do you need? Well, that, for example, depends a little bit on your training frequency. So there's uh, reasonable evidence that doing about 10 sets is superior to doing uh, less than 10 sets, but it's 10 sets a week. So it depends a little bit on how you uh, divide your training uh, split, essentially. So do you do two days with five sets or do you do three days with three sets? Um, so you can play around with that uh a little bit. My guess is also that it's highly dependent on training status. Um, so if you've been doing 10 sets for a year, at some point your body is pretty much used to that and then volume likely needs to uh, increase. Uh, another variable often discussed is how much weight should you use? Is there like an hypertrophy uh, uh, range where uh, it's just optimal and then often you hear six to 12 reps? I think uh, ACSM, which is essentially the, the biggest uh, organization in fitness, uh, still recommends that. But um, so Stu Phillips started that research line and very clearly demonstrated that essentially with any 
uh, amount of weight you can build muscle as long as you train to muscular failure. Um, so yeah, the goal of training essentially is to uh, recruit and fatigue your muscle fibers and doesn't really matter if you do uh, uh, a very heavy weight and then obviously you can only do a few reps or that you do uh, uh, very little weights or even Jeremy Lunecki has shown that even without any weights and I'm not talking about body weight training, no, literally just contracting the muscle, so could almost call it posing, mm -hmm. uh, even with that you can um, build muscle mass as long as you train to fatigue. And uh, other evidence that supports that is, for example, from blood flow restriction, where the idea is that you uh, wrap a band, uh, for example, around your arms. Um, therefore, uh, oxygen re can really get into the muscle and uh, potentially the metabolic uh, products cannot really escape the muscle. So your muscle fatigues much earlier. So that sounds like a bad thing, but because your muscle is fatigued much earlier, that is really the only thing the muscle senses. So with very little weight and very little reps, you already fully fatigued the muscle. So the muscle pretty much thinks I have to grow. So weight and reps doesn't really matter as long as you yeah, fatigue the muscle. And then does it really need to be failure? Probably not if you stay one to two reps shy of failure, it's probably fine. Um, other variables is, for example, rest periods. Um, but it's also pretty clear that you want at least two minutes of rest uh, between sets. Um, and then, uh, of course, frequency is also highly uh, debated. Um, but again, it's pretty clear that you want at least a training frequency of two times per week, where you hit each muscle group uh, at least two times per week. And then whether more is better is not really clear. So those I would say are the general guidelines uh, in which a good training program has to uh, yeah, has to play with. Um, but then whether it's two, three, four, or even six times, it's, it's highly debatable. Also, um, what's a little bit difficult in, uh, in uh, research is that we all want to do the super sexy studies, but it's very simple to do a study to show that training three times per week is better than training one time per week, for example, but to find a difference between training four times per week and training five times per week, that, that essentially you need a study of 10,000 subjects to find, because it's diminishing returns, right? Mm -hmm. So all the sexy hypotheses are almost impossible to show in a study, um, which is, I guess, like the frustration of a lot of people. Why, why do researchers always do these basic studies? I thought we already knew this. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if you look at, I call it the sexy questions. So does the, the high frequency matter? Does nutrient timing matters? It's very likely that your study is too small. Um, so basically, you have statistical issues to come to proper conclusions. And then people say, see, it doesn't really matter what training frequency is or nutrient timing doesn't matter, which isn't the correct uh, conclusion either. It's just a statistical uh, issue. So, yeah, I don't think we'll have any clear evidence uh, what's, about what's truly optimal because those, yeah, those sexy research questions are very difficult. But I do think we have pretty good guidelines uh, within which rules we have to play. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's great. That's really comprehensive. Um, so just to like quickly, I guess, try to summarize that you, you basically are saying you want to be doing at least 10 sets per week that may increase depending on your level of training advancement, um, probably be for the most part in the six to 12 rep range. But as long as you're within some reasonable proximity to failure, probably doesn't matter the, the actual rep count. Um, generally want to be resting two minutes or so between sets. Um, is there something special about two minutes or is it more so that it just allows recovery so you can sort of use more load in later sets? Yeah, that that seems to be it. Um, so if people don't want to uh, wait two minutes, um, a simple option is superset exercises. So do, for example, a bench press and then do something easy like a leg extension. Mm -hmm. um, to be fair, so this is again, it's, it's difficult in research. It's pretty clear that longer rest periods are superior to short rest periods. But then what's being compared is like 
six sets of uh, one minute rest versus six sets of five minute rest. And then the conclusion is that five minute rest is superior, but you could argue your training lasts four to five times longer. What if you use all that time to do more sets, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So it's there's so many variables you can play around with that it's almost impossible to get the perfect answer. So that's why I always say it's a little bit of an art and that's yeah. why we need personal trainers that yeah, can tailor it to the needs of the individual. Right, yeah, that's well said too. Um, on the point of frequency, I think it, it, it's become relatively uncontroversial that at least training twice a week is is better than once a week for hypertrophy and naturals. Um, there are some people I think still pushing this that like one times a week, one time a week really does seem to well work well if volume is you know matched between conditions. And in my in my experience in the field, there are tons of natural bodybuilders at the very top who are still running bro splits for twenty years and they get fantastic results doing it. Um, I guess you could always argue that they might get better results or they might have gotten even better results if they had gone twice a week. Um, but I feel like the question of frequency tends to be diminished by just simple training age and consistency over time. So it's like within a one year period or something, you might get more results if you trained more frequently, even with fixed volume. Um, but across a 10 or 20 year career, I just don't know. I feel like at some point you're just going to hit your, your genetic limitation, uh, perhaps regardless. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, and then I'd also be curious just to know, like from a, muscle protein synthesis researcher if you think that there is at least mechanistic uh, potential benefit in getting those more frequent blips in muscle protein synthesis um, because as you probably know it doesn't the, the sensitivity to amino acids following training doesn't really last that long like it's not lasting a week right uh, or probably not anyway so it seems like you're at least wasting some potential b- spikes in synthesis uh, if you wait too long between training how much do you think this really matters in the real world? Um, so the longest increase in muscle protein synthesis that has been shown after exercise is uh, 72 hours. Um, so that is, fits nicely in line with you need to train at least two times per week. But then the question is also, um, even if you do like a super bro split, and you do chest on one day and you do uh, delts on another day, and maybe even triceps where you start out with a, a close grip wrench. How many times have you trained each muscle group, right? Mm-hmm. So that's almost like you have for chest have like a heavy day and an, a moderate day. And maybe the delts you even train three times. So even if you do yeah, a full on split, how many times have you hit all those muscles? Really? That's uh, that's always difficult. Um, yeah, it's. My guess is that, yeah, th- that frequency matters a little bit, but yeah, L- like yeah, it's like you mentioned, it's um, as l- if you train ten years, you're you should be more or less at your genetic potential either way. You could argue that your genetic potential is like five percent higher. Um, if you optimize things that you never reach that level if you don't have everything dialed in Um, I'm always very pragmatic so like 90% of the discussions in fitness are just perspective so you have uh, I call it the minimalists Um, essentially they say nothing matters it's just about total amount of protein uh, just about total volume those are the two things you should worry about nothing else matters and that's for them it's perfect right if they would have to worry about every possible uh, technique that could give like a three percent uh, increase in gains they would go completely nuts it's more or less a hobby um, and the only one of it's essentially like the 80 20 percent rule like focus on the 20 percent that gives 80 percent of the results and then you have competitive athletes that yeah by definition they want to win they want to do everything and for them, it's just annoying when you say like, oh, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. No, they are like, what can I possibly do to beat the guy next to me? So um, things like frequency, it it really depends. If you enjoy training uh, once a week and your goal isn't to be a, a competitive bodybuilder, do it. Perfect. It's only dangerous when people then online argue like, oh, it doesn't really matter. 
like, yeah, to me, it's all perspective. Mm -hmm. So always, yeah, in a discussion, people should make clear, like, I think this gives 80% of the results. I don't really care about doing five times as much work for a little bit extra. And, you know, if that's openly communicated, then it's like, fine, I'm going to give this a try uh, because it might be beneficial. Right, right. Yeah. And um, I think I, I should say that I guess that whole like 10 year argument where frequency isn't going to matter, I, I guess that. I'm saying that in the context of assuming all the other variables are in place, like you are training sufficiently intensely, you know, you do have sufficient volume, um, you're good exercise selection, and you know, all those other variables are in place. I feel like frequency kind of does take a step or two back in terms of priority uh, within that context. Um, Maybe to uh, add on real quick. So yeah, probably um, one of the reasons why high frequency um, training got popular more in the evidence based fitness community, so to speak, um, is that there's some research that suggests that that increase in muscle protein synthesis becomes uh, shorter the more trained you are. And therefore, if you're very trained, you should train almost daily um, because you're lucky if your MPS increase even lasts uh, a day if you're trained. To be fair, that is not as well established as some people suggest. Um, so when you when we measure muscle protein synthesis, we can look at different types of muscle protein synthesis, essentially. So um, in older studies, we just looked at what's called mixed muscle protein synthesis. So you just look at whatever protein is in the muscle and you see how it responds. Um, but you have all kinds of different proteins in the muscle. So we are interested in myofibular proteins. So these are the proteins that can contract, so give you strength, but are also the big ones that give you muscle mass, for example. Um, you also have, for example, mitochondria, uh, which we can measure, mitochondrial protein synthesis, very relevant for endurance athletes, not so much uh, in fitness and strength. Um, and what you see is if you're untrained and uh, you start lifting, pretty much every type of protein in your muscle is like, what is going on? I need to adapt to this. So you see with uh, an untrained person, if he's gonna train, uh, mitochondrial protein synthesis is stimulated, for example. So if you m measure mixed muscle protein synthesis, you say, oh, this is going up a lot. And after like three months, your mitochondria no longer need to uh, adapt to resistance training anymore. And then if you only look at mixed muscle protein synthesis, you say like, oh, the response is now down, but it is the other irrelevant type of proteins that are no longer adapting. Um, when you actually look at the myofibular protein, it's not that clear that that um, response becomes shorter. So the theory that the MPS response becomes shorter the more uh, advanced you are, it's not that clear. To be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if it's shorter, but it's not as clear as some people um, make it uh, seem. Um, what I also want to add is maybe um, – even if it's true, maybe you should train more frequent, but the alternative is what happens if I double the volume of my workout? That might also simply uh, increase and prolong the muscle protein synthetic response. So again, there's various ways um, you can play around with your training programs. The only thing that is just clear is you need to force your body to adapt, um, otherwise nothing is gonna happen. So just, I'll, just messing around with frequency on its own is not going to do that much. I think you always, your weekly volume should increase uh, the more advanced you are, which makes sense if you think of sun tanning, for example. You need yeah, low intensity, maybe once a week to get a little bit uh, darker. But then, yeah, the more advanced you are, you have to do it more often, higher intensity, longer. That's ultimately always, yeah, you simply need a bigger stimulus. Now, I would argue the higher your total weekly volume gets, in practice, you almost always need to improve your frequency to, to handle that. Because, yeah, are you going to do 30 sets of legs one day? That, that seems horrible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Yeah. And I, I guess the only issue that I have with that, like, very essentialist line um, is that it, you know, you mentioned like people will say, okay, all you need to worry about is your weekly volume and your protein intake. Um, I feel like 
in that context, training intensity, and by that I mean intensity of effort, does almost unfairly take a back seat. It's like this volume is only important uh, in the context of a sufficient training intensity. Um, so I feel like if anything should come first, especially in light of all this research showing that, you know, provided the sets are taken sufficiently close to failure, you can get similar hypertrophy across all these spectrums of rep ranges. I think that that should put almost intensity in, in the driver's seat, um, at least in the passenger seat. I don't know. Um, so what? Yeah. So based on that what's really interesting is like uh, pretty much like you mentioned so if let's say you could do 20 sets of legs on a day how much is that 20 set worth because your performance will be horrible because there's already muscle damage etc and fatigue on the other hand your muscle doesn't care about the weight similar as with the blood flow restriction you're doing a low uh, amount of weight and f your muscle just experiences it as difficult so I, I wouldn't be surprised if your 20th set is pretty worthless, but at the same token, I wouldn't be surprised if it's just as valuable as your first set because just even though your performance is horrible, your your muscle is like, oh, again, a set to fatigue. So, yeah, there's a lot to uh, lot left to discover in that uh, topic. What, one last quick training question for you. What What is your thought on progressive overload? How important do you think that is for hypertrophic adaptations over the long term uh, again depends on the definition of it um, to me progressive overload is essentially that tanning um, analogy again it can be anything so if you go tanning more frequently that works if you uh, tan longer that works if you improve the intensity of the tanning that works um, a lot of people just um, take progressive overload as oh, you need to do heavier weights over time. And then they think if they have a 10 repetition max this week, and then in two months, they do uh, more weight, but for eight repetitions, that it's progressive overload, but you're just trading weight for less reps in that set. So that's not truly progressive overload. So either your total weekly volume needs to increase, for example, or you need to do more weight, but for the same amount of reps. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I absolutely believe progressive overload is the basis of everything, but it's not necessarily more weight. Uh, ideally, it's more weight because just practically you cannot simply add more and more and more sets that just from a time uh, point of view is suboptimal, probably also from an... Uh, uh, from a recovery aspect. So in the ideal world, um, you keep your volume relatively low and just add uh, weight every week, maintain the same amount of reps each set. That's the perfect world. Then you're clearly progressing, just linear progression, everyone's happy. Um, but at some point that will no longer work and then you have to add uh, weekly sets and that's just another uh, form of progressive overload. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would say though that yeah, the classical definition, or at least that's most used uh, in the online community, is getting heavier over time is a pretty good indicator. So you can do all, you can add all the volume you want. If your bench isn't going up, your five repetition max, or maybe your ten doesn't really matter, isn't going up, then probably that volume isn't really working. Either you're overtraining or still undertraining. So I would say that is a very good indicator, or of if your other stuff is working essentially. Mm -hmm. I got gotcha. you. I guess like recently, I, I, I wouldn't say I've become like skeptical of the principle. I guess I've just been become a little bit like, I guess, less enthralled with its position in this whole like dogma, because um, if you just look at a lot of bodybuilders who are at the top, um, a lot of them don't apply progressive overload. They go in and use muscle confusion and get fantastic results. Um, so I would potentially argue just based on that basis that maybe progressive overload isn't required for hypertrophy, but it just like accentuates the, the progress, if that makes sense. Um, or would you say it, it maybe these people who are using muscle confusion do in fact have some form of progression in place, they just don't realize it? Um, I think the latter. I think they have progression without realizing it. Um, but I have, I, I have no clear data on it. I don't have clear uh, empirical evidence either. But I can assume if you just always like what we do know is that different uh, exercises stimulate different types of muscle fibers. So the, the uh, well, I'm not talking here about type one or type two muscle fibers, but more the, the 
just the angle how we mm-hmm. online we always call it this muscle uh, this exercise hits this muscle from this angle so the pattern of recruitment is is different mm-hmm. so i can imagine that if you week one all you do is bench then the second week you do um uh, flies for example that you overload essentially uh, other fibers um well you more or less maintain the training stimulus, like it's so obviously a weaker stimulus for the other fibers, but it's enough to not go down. And then um, third week you do uh, dumbbell press, for example, and then you go back to to your bench. But the, the, so the people who do muscle confusion, so to say, they, they don't track their workouts. So they, because they don't really care about that, right? So they, they are more about like, um, yeah, the mind muscle connection. So they might not realize that over a year their bench has still increased. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think yeah, power lifters, for example, they always track their workout. So they, they know whether or not something is working. Um, while more bodybuilders they don't focus on it, but my my gut is that they are progressing over time. Right. Um, because otherwise it seems weird to me that if you if you would continue to switch around variables and then five years later you come back to your bench and you still lift you can still bench the same time the same as what you did the first time um you ever benched like evolutionary that makes no sense right Mm -hmm. you've got all this muscle mass and you still cannot really you're still not adapted to anything Mm -hmm. so yeah my guess is there is there is progressive overload Right. Um, I guess like the only other counter example I would think of, I'm not sure if you've seen this, but there was this case study where this guy had this really rare muscular condition. Uh, I forget what it was called, but it basically caused the muscle to constantly be contracted, or at least it was like contracted way more frequently than a normal person would be. And uh, if you just look at this guy, he never weight trained at all. But if you look at the guy's back, it's like extremely muscular. So that seems to be an example of hypertrophy in the absence of progressive overload, but yet in the presence of a lot of muscular activation or at least uh, contraction or what have you. Um, so I, I'd be just, I guess just like, I don't know, conjecturally like wh- where does sort of like muscle activation fit in with this whole like progressive uh, principle because I could see progressive overload being applied in a very like lackadaisical way. Whereas if you have like high levels of activation, high levels of effort, um, I, f- I feel like you could see significant muscle hypertrophy even in the absence of progressive overload perhaps. It's a controversial statement yeah. and I'm not sure if so it's that, true or not. But So yeah. this pretty much comes back down to that study from uh, Jeremy Lunecki who showed that even um, with um, just contracting your muscles without any weight, uh, people could stimulate muscle growth, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so my guess is that when he was 15, he wasn't as big as he w- when he was 20. So. His muscles were contracting. Um, as a result, there is some hypertrophy, and then they contract again, but just harder. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I think the biggest issue is that um, uh, progressive overload is used uh, synonymous with doing more weight, mm-hmm. but right. that's not necessarily true. So, I bet if you take an untrained guy, let him. Uh, Pose right now. Look at his. Uh, even though perhaps EMG data is not optimal to see how how much tension there is in the muscle, but let's just use that for now. See how hard his muscles are contracting. Uh, then let him uh, continue posing um, for the next six months, and then afterwards uh, do the same thing. I bet that after six months he is able to pose a lot harder and that his muscles are able to generate a lot more force um, but he hasn't used more weight but just uh, yeah, in his posing uh, positions the muscles are still trying to contract as hard as possible and he is generating more force. Mm-hmm. Um, so I want to dig into the, the dietary factors here uh, but really quickly you just sparked my memory when you said EMG um, and uh, I guess I've received quite a bit of criticism for using EMG research uh, to support the use of certain specific exercises. Um, And there was recently a paper published, you probably read it, um, Andrew Vygotsky was at least one of the authors on it. Um, And it basically like just called into question the 
validity of using EMG to um, support exercises and it, that it doesn't really scale with hypertrophy well, or at least there's no evidence of that. Um, and having read the paper, it seems like the main line that they take against using EMG uh, to endorse like training, actual like training recommendations uh, is that, it, you know, the, the general China line of reasoning is that higher EMG amplitude means greater neuromuscular excitation, which means greater activation greater motor unit recruitment, greater rates of muscle protein synthesis, and then greater hypertrophy over time. Um, they took an issue, which I think a lot of people do, with that final link, which is basically muscle protein synthesis over time correlates with more hypertrophy over time. Apparently, that isn't as well established as people think, or it's definitely um, come under quite a bit of criticism recently. What do you think of, of that criticism? Yeah, so... Muscle protein synthesis is my baby, so people are calling my baby ugly. So take this all with a grain uh, with a grain of salt. But so I, I have no experience with EMG data, no expert on it. Um, we have people down the hall that that do. Um, they are they are more skeptical of that initial step that uh, the EMG translate to higher muscle protein synthesis. But I would rather not comment on it because it's not my expertise. Um, but obviously, the idea of measuring muscle protein synthesis is to look at the uh, anabolic potential of an intervention, either of certain exercise program or from nutrition. Um, and then pretty much the, the study that uh, that yeah, triggered this whole discussion, I, I remember it clearly, that paper came uh, that first paper came online, I'll, I'll discuss in a second. And I walked to one of the authors who was currently working here. I'm like, oh, what did you guys do? <laughs> this is going to be a shitstorm. And yes, it is. <laughs> um, so that first study, essentially what they did is uh, untrained uh, guys, they exercised, resistance exercise, and they measured muscle protein synthesis for uh, four hours after exercise. And then uh, they trained for, I think, 10 weeks or so. Uh, and looked at do the rates of muscle protein synthesis after that first session correlate with uh, um, muscle mass gain. So the guy who has the highest muscle protein synthesis after exercise, does he also gain uh, the most muscle? Well, that didn't seem to work out. Um, and then a lot of people said, see, the muscle protein synthesis is useless, blah, 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 blah. Um, that's my baby. So, uh, <laughs> but, so I think the main issue is that I come back down. Uh, I come back to the to the rocket science. The muscle protein uh, synthesis stuff is really complex, and in my opinion, most people don't really get it. Um, so they just come to conclusions where they should, like like me with the EMG, people should say like I don't fully understand this and be a little bit careful with their conclusions. Um, so. We mentioned earlier muscle of uh, exercise can stimulate muscle protein synthesis for 72 hours, uh, probably in practice most often 24 to 48 hours. So measuring muscle protein synthesis in the first four hours doesn't make that much sense, right? It's like measuring the first five kilometers of a marathon and then say, well, that guy sprinted the hard, the fastest in the first five kilometers of a marathon. So he's clearly going to win. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm doesn't really uh, uh, work like that. Or let's say we put you in a DEXA right now, you exercise and we put you in a DEXA again tomorrow and then say, well, you didn't gain any muscle mass, so resistance exercise doesn't work. Right. No, this, the method has certain assumptions and if you violate those assumptions, the method becomes useless. But the problem is that most people don't understand the assumptions of muscle protein synthesis. So one of them is that the timeline that you measure muscle protein synthesis has to capture the uh, the muscle protein synthetic response. So I would fully agree that it's a bad idea to measure muscle protein synthesis for four hours when the actual response is more like 48 hours. That is pretty much the conclusion from that study. Mm -hmm. So then uh, that's that research was followed up with uh, a next study in which uh, Subjects trained for six weeks, but now they didn't measure muscle protein synthesis after one exercise of, uh, uh, sorry, after one training session. They measured it over the entire six week period. And uh, lo and behold, good correlation. Mm -hmm. So this time, when you actually measure muscle protein synthesis 
over the whole period that you measure muscle mass gains, then all of a sudden uh, uh, it makes sense. So again, the time period that you measure muscle protein synthesis is very important. Now, theoretically, you should be able to measure the muscle protein synthesis uh, response to one exercise uh, session and predict um, uh, muscle hypertrophy over a longer period. But again, in that case, your muscle protein synthesis measurement has to capture that entire uh, muscle protein synthetic response of that exercise session. Mm -hmm. So uh, the same authors from that first paper that didn't find it, did a study where they essentially learned from their mistakes and improved uh, their study. And now they measured muscle protein synthesis uh, for 24 and 48 hours after a training session. And uh, so essentially capturing that whole uh, training response. And uh, in that study, again, uh, muscle protein synthesis did predict muscle mass gains. Um, One, uh, one extra note is it didn't in completely untrained uh, subjects. And the reason there was that when you're completely untrained, um, we covered this a little bit earlier, like all proteins in, in, your, uh, in your muscle essentially get damaged. Uh, muscle doesn't know what's going on. And there's a very high muscle protein synthetic rate, but it isn't used for muscle gain. Um, the muscle protein synthesis is used for repair. So. It's essentially artificially high, but not to build myofibular proteins, but to repair the other proteins. Um, but that's only true in completely untrained subjects. After just four weeks of training, um, essentially um, the muscle protein synthesis uh, response becomes specialized to focus on myofibular protein synthesis. Uh, and then there was a very good correlation. So essentially from the three studies that we have, um, two of them who make sense, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, clearly show a good correlation. The only study uh, that shows no correlation also makes completely sense that in that condition, there is uh, there is no correlation. It would almost be weird mm-hmm. if there was a correlation. Um, now, I've seen some people who have you know kept up with this research and now came to the conclusion, oh, you should measure muscle protein synthesis over longer periods, and a four-hour period is bad. That's not true either, at least not necessarily true. So um, again, the time period should match the muscle protein synthetic response you're looking at. So if you're looking at the muscle protein synthetic response to training, then it should probably be at least 24 hours. But if you're looking at the muscle protein synthetic response to uh, protein ingestion, that muscle protein synthetic response is maybe four hours. So if I would give you a protein shake now, measure your muscle protein synthesis over the next four hours, I probably would see a nice increase, uh, and that's the correct uh, conclusion. However, if I give you a protein shake now and measure your muscle protein synthesis over the next three months, I wouldn't see an increase in muscle protein synthesis because of this one shake. Mm -hmm. That is because I measure too long, much longer than that your protein shake works. So essentially the message here is, your measurement period has to match whatever you're looking at. Um, but if you don't realize that, then yeah, obviously you're gonna draw the wrong conclusion. So the bottom line is yes, muscle protein synthesis rates should and indeed do predict muscle mass gains, but only if the measurements uh, are done logically, which again is also true for a DEX or any, any measurement. Uh, one thing I would add, uh, I would even argue that muscle protein synthesis measurements are often even better than the long-term studies. Uh, and here's why. So unfortunately, gaining muscle mass is a very slow process. So, okay, let's, if I wanted to become really popular online, here's what I would do. I take anything that's controversial, let's say foam rolling, I would take two groups, one group does foam rolling for six weeks, the other group doesn't. Uh, Take, let's say, 10 subjects in each group uh, and measure muscle mass before and after. And then my conclusion would be, most likely there's no difference in muscle mass gains between those two groups. But realistically, even if 
foam rolling would increase recovery, therefore better training, more volume, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at best, it would give like a 10% increase. And in order for that 10% increase to be detectable in a study, subjects would have to train much longer. So if you gain a kilogram in six weeks and the other group would gain 1.1 kilogram of muscle mass, that's not significantly different. If both groups would train six months, it would be like four kilograms and 4.4, like the difference is now 400 uh, grams of lean mass. And that might be statistically uh, significant. So the problem is that a lot of long-term studies are just very underpowered. So the proper way to do it would be to do one gigantic study. So like, let them train or let them foam roll for six months and have probably three times as many people uh, in each group. Then you have uh, sufficient statistical power, except that your study is 18 times bigger, six times three. Um, so either I can do 18 wrong studies, at least the wrong conclusion, mm -hmm. uh, and people would love me because I would have 18 publications. So oh, you're in your busting all these myths, see foam rolling, waste of time, uh, only hurts, la la la. I would be the most popular guys, but I would know that one big study would give a better, well, actually the real correct conclusion. So um, in I have a lot more faith in most muscle protein synthesis studies than in most training studies that find no significant differences between groups that are you know just small studies like mm -hmm. if it's less than 10 weeks of training uh, and it doesn't have like 20 plus subjects in each group i have very little faith in the study mm -hmm. doesn't mean that it's worthless because all that data can be used later in a meta-analysis but that study on its own is pretty well i would say deceiving because you Mm -hmm. get the wrong conclusion, but it's just a statistical issue. Yeah, that's an interesting take. I usually don't hear it that way. It usually goes like, well, this, you know, MPS data is good and all, but we need the chronic long-term studies to kind of corroborate it. But I definitely hear what you're saying just because of the methodological um, issues with that longer-term research, just the way it's usually set up. So, so just to very quickly add there, um, so what people might not realize is that these muscle protein synthesis studies, for example, they seem easier because it's you can do it in one day often. Uh, but actually, the amount of money that these cost, um, they're much more expensive than most longer term studies. So if we or others thought that the longer term studies were better, um, we would happily only do those and do like the coolest uh, long term studies. Um, but the reality is like you need all types of evidence, right? So you need the mechanical of the mechanistic stuff. You need the long term uh, and ideally you do both. So ideally you have the long term measurements of muscle protein synthesis during a training study. But essentially anyone who dismisses any line of research, even the animal work, even the in vitro, even the observational just doesn't really get it. Uh, if there seems to be inconsistencies between studies, you need a good explanation. You have to explain why muscle protein synthesis doesn't translate to the long-term study. And for example, the conclusion could be, well, the long-term study was statistically underpowered. Mm -hmm. For example, about 80% of um, protein supplementation studies show that protein supplementation does not increase muscle mass. And the only reason is because the studies are just too small. Mm -hmm. Two little subjects, not long enough. So if we didn't have the muscle protein synthesis studies uh, that clearly showed an anabolic response to protein, we would have given up on protein altogether like 50 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and only like in, I think like, it's now nine years ago, we did, our lab did the first meta-analysis that for the first time convincingly showed that protein works, but only when you combined all those, uh, yeah, small protein studies essentially. So... Yeah. Yeah, main takeaway, you need everything. And if something doesn't seem to be consistent, you need a solid explanation. And if your explanation is, well, that doesn't translate to that, what, what it really means is I don't get that, so I'm going to ignore that. Right, right. Yeah, it, it, it's always been a bit of a weird line for me to, to see or to read because it, it, to me it almost sounds like saying, like just going back to your wall analogy, it's like 
adding bricks to the wall doesn't correlate well with wall size. It's like it's, it's yeah. it really should. So to argue so, the other so side, the, you, you need a really good argument to tell me that it doesn't correlate, right? Exactly. So um, I think the mistake that people make there is that they read a lot about um, the molecular markers of protein synthesis, which is like gene expression and stuff like that. Um, and the thing is, muscle protein synthesis is literally the physiology. So it's not something theoretically, it is literally looking our amino acids being added to the wall. So it's the definition of getting bigger. Yeah. So yeah. like you say, if it doesn't correlate, something weird is going on. Yeah. But uh, so I think people confuse it with uh, like gene expression. Right. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're growing. That's just a signal that your body says, hey, maybe we should grow. But then um, just to address that very, very briefly, um, let's say that your genes say, hey, maybe we should go, uh, grow because you did exercise. But if you don't eat and you don't have the building blocks to build, nothing's going to happen. So the gene expression stuff doesn't necessarily translate. But the muscle protein synthesis is literally the wall is growing. So... Of course you're growing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and even just to make this case from another side, I guess, I, I've i always like, or well, I haven't always said, but at least since I've encountered this criticism, I, I've kind of realized that if you combine other research, so if you look at research, say, comparing soy, you know, giving subjects soy protein versus giving them milk protein, you tend to see greater spikes in MPS with the, the milk protein. And then when you look at the, the chronic trials in different studies, you t also tend to see more hypertrophy with the milk versus the soy. Um, so, it, you know, putting those two together, it seems to really line up um, that, that, of course, you know, one is predictive of the other, I think. Yeah, so, so the way I see it is that um, the muscle protein synthesis, like muscle protein synthesis can go up three to five fold uh, easily. So it's much easier to see the anabolic potential of something. Um, but then in how much muscle gain does that actually uh, result? For that, you kind of need the long-term uh, mm -hmm. studies because what the mistake people make is that, oh, muscle protein synthesis is increased by 50%, so I'm going to make 50% more muscle mass gains. But that doesn't really work because how long is muscle pro is, if muscle protein synthesis is elevated by 50% the whole day, then yes, that should translate. But if you have whey versus soy, for example, and it increases muscle protein synthesis for uh, with 50% the way compared to the soy for the three hours after exercise, then essentially you need to divide that by eight to get mm -hmm. 24 hours to see how much extra muscle mass gains uh, that's going to result in. Right. Um, okay, so Joran, I'd like to jump into all the diet stuff and protein stuff to make it a little bit more practical. Um, first, I think we're, we're going to take a quick little break here uh, just for the listeners. And then um, when we come back, we're going to dig into all the, the protein stuff to do with this.